welcome to festa thank you so much for doing this and i'm really thrilled to be having this conversation with you um i would really like if you introduce yourself and you know a little bit of about what you're doing currently and what is it that you've been involved over the years and if you could just tell us a little bit about your background it would be great for us okay thank you very much so my name is michele i was um first i live in the uk i work i live in the uk work in the lived in the uk for the past 12 years right um but i was born in africa right i was born in zimbabwe in a city right. called hawaii right so for my academic background really um i did my phd here in the uk university mm -hmm. and my this is made up on social psychology right. whatever is got some dimensions um of cultural psychology mm -hmm. which I'm which I hope I'm going to talk about at some point mm -hmm. and it's got a dimension of um developmental psychology mm -hmm. got a dimension as well of media psychology mm -hmm. and um it's critical in approach which gives me critical expertise in social psychology Mm -hmm. and i um my thesis was framed in a social constructionist perspective that's mm -hmm. one of the most interesting perspectives in psychology for me mm -hmm. uh, i'll talk about that at some point for me mm -hmm. i'm going to talk about that and my mm -hmm. analysis was um thematic combination of thematic and discourse analysis mm -hmm. so um at the moment i work for art and university so for the time mm -hmm. and I um I teach quite a number of modules my work involves teaching you know supervising dissertation and, um you know all kinds of lecture um what else we really? I have published papers from my um from my PhD and I've also written a book out of my PhD but my current project which I am working on now with a colleague um at an university um is not really connected to my it's something really different um something to do with gender identity and domestic violence which i can i will talk about um a bit later so that's that's it really about my background unless if you want to ask me questions about my background which i did not say i'm here to answer <laughs> of course of course thank you so much for this Um, I just like to ask a follow-up question because you mentioned social psychology. So I know we've talked about this before that your interest also spans around cultural and media psychology. So keeping in mind social, cultural, media psychology, I wanted to ask what really motivated your interest to study these um, uh, fields of discipline, and uh, what are some of the? If you could also talk about some of the interesting research methods. you've had to rely or develop for the same or in the same while publishing your papers yeah 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 i can i can um thank you for that question so to start with the kind of methods that i have used um are under qualitative research methods um my all my all my work is i believe that there are some things that there, there are some questions we cannot ask through numbers right so going to understand subjective experiences of people you need to factor in that these are more complex meaning is is wrapped in the discourses in the way they talk so if you want to capture that complexity you want to engage people you want to talk you want to talk to people as one line of it. um and then um the other reason why i do um qualitative research is because you get to work with some um critical methods like discourse analysis for example instead of treating people's accounts like facts discourse analysis treats accounts as discourse because if you treat them as facts the next thing you normalize certain things on the basis of those accounts and also in the worst case scenario you may start pathologizing people because you are treating accounts as facts but if i use discourse analysis i don't do that 
And another interesting thing, maybe, um, you know, this may sound controversial, but it's one of the, uh, you know, interesting uh, points really that I, um, I, I love to put across. When you adopt, let's say, um, a kind of research method that claims objectivity, to me, I, I don't think you're really being honest with people and yourself. I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay, I'll tell you why. So as a qualitative researcher, I, I do make my position known to people who read my work. But if you take an approach that claims objectivity, we have to ask you some questions. Like, you know, um, for you to ask any question in the research, are you not imposed, are you not importing some assumptions already? The answer is yes, you are. Therefore, there is the, you we cannot really pretend, you know, uh, or hide and say we are being objective. Every research is done from a particular philosophical standpoint. You don't do research from nowhere. Everyone sees the world from a particular philosophical position. So the kind of research that I do makes it easy for me to say, okay, this is who I am. This, these are my philosophical views. And this is how my philosophical views impact on the research that I do. So that's one reason why, that's another reason why I um, adopt a quali qualitative approaches. Maybe I'll talk about social constructionism a bit later. But another thing, um, um, you know, I also, uh, my work is um, critical in nature. I describe myself as a um, critical social psychologist. I think about the work I did for my PhD, I remember that when I was an undergraduate, this is an interesting story. When I was an undergraduate uh, student doing my undergraduate degree, I did not know many things by then. But one of the days we're doing a lecture, I remember it was um, on the module called Evolutional Psychology. You know, and the lecturer walked in, introduced the lecture and began to talk. Then she gets to a point where she talks about, um, you know, bring, throws in some theories around, you know, intelligence, and she talks about personalities and happiness and how these things um, are inherited. And she goes on to, you know, introduce some um, work around, you know, ideas around um, eugenics and determinism. She wasn't really, you know, saying she supports the ideas, but she was not showing the critical side. Of it. And I, I, I did not agree with that at that time. And I still don't even do So when I, when I had an opportunity to do my um, undergraduate uh, dissertation, I thought I would do a study on, um, on twins and try and follow up on what she said, because the ideas were based on twin studies. And guess what, Sanjana, I was shocked, my findings, I discovered that some of the things that were, you know, that were coming across as signs were not really signs, they were pseudoscience. And some of the facts were actually not facts, they were not true. Think about um, somebody like, maybe you have heard his name, think about somebody like Francis Alton. When we think about um, when we think about the Holocaust, you know the killing of many Jews in Germany. We think about the Germans, but did you know that the idea of um, eugenics was based here in the UK? Did you know that? Yeah, that was a British scholar. That idea was based here. It was a British scholar who started the idea of. Um, of eugenics. Then um, at some point, Hitler picked it up and he took it to the extreme. Of course, I'm grateful because 
the scholars in the UK, they are not really endorsing the, his ideas. I know that there is, a, there is a university in London that used to be a memorial lecture named after Francis Dalton. They have since changed the lecture's name to dis disassociate themselves from you know, those ideas. But I'm only bringing this in to explain to you why am I taking a critical approach to psychology? Because number one, some people have used um, their, their, their power as researchers to, to promote scientific racism, to further their political agendas, you know, and they have taken the advantage of being um, psychologists to, you know, push in through some theories which are really not scientific, but pseudoscience. So that makes me to, that made me to question things and I still question things today. Therefore, I adopt an approach of um, critical psychology. Then uh, finally, on why, what motivated me to do, um, to, take, to, to be interested in cultural psychology? This is an interesting question, and I anticipated that. I think I wrote some points here which I want to share with you. Mm -hmm. I've got, yeah, I've got about six points. Yeah. Yeah, I'll explain them to you. So sure. let, me, let, me, let me read the first one, then I'll explain it. Sure. So number one, because all varieties of psychology are culturally and historically constructed. There is a need, therefore, for alternative voices in psychology to confirm or to resist ideological assumptions in the mainstream model. Now, the, the point here is that this the version of psychology that we have did not just fall from nowhere. Mm -hmm. It was people, in this case, people in the Western world and people in mm -hmm. Europe, you know, scholars from this side of the world, who developed those ideas, they, they would develop the the, you know, who brought in the discipline of psychology and were thankful for that, mm -hmm. you know. And um, the, the reason why I am interested in cultural psychology is that the ideas that are there, to me, as a Black scholar and an African for that matter, some of them are, were developed out of my context, out of my culture. They were developed in a different culture, you know, in a different context. So their relevance to me has to be reflected on. Cultural psychology allows me to do that. Number two, rather than straightforward accounts of natural text, cultural psychology analysis emphasizes that conventional scientific wisdom both reflects and promotes perspectives and interests of people in affluent weird spaces. Here the word uh, weird is an abbreviation for Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So most of the material in psychology reflects the agenda and the interest of this small group of people. And then how about the rest of the world? How about <laughs> India? How about Africa? How about China? How about so we have to really, we have to step out of psychology and say, hold on, let's think about this. You know, um, is the is this version of psychology inclusive? Is it reflecting the whole world? The answer is no. Therefore, my interest in cultural psychology is it gives me an opportunity to engage in a debate and also to you know, highlight some of the stuff which was silenced by mainstream psychology. Right. Then at the third point, again, contrary to the rhetoric of scientific inquiry, scientific institutions and practices are not transcendent. A neutral enterprise is embodied from culture, politics, power, instead, Science is a position form of knowledge that reflects understandings and interests of people in positions of dominance. You know, I think that's a straightforward point, but a good example really is 
the stuff I gave you about Francis Galton. Yes. You know, he used science for political agendas and he was able to get some to influence policy, you know, through that controversial theorizing. And finally, um, you know, concepts and ideologies and the way the philosophical positions that people take, they, they cannot be separated from their culture. Right. There's an argument in cultural psychology that says culture and mind make one another. The mind makes the culture, but the culture makes the mind. So psychology reflects a biased, in a way, a biased cultural perspectives to some extent, because mm -hmm. it is a Western brainchild. Right. Psychology is a brainchild of, you know, Europe and America. But uh, my interest in cultural psychology is, it gives me an opportunity to say, okay, let's think about Africa. Mm -hmm. Let's think about India. Mm -hmm. Let's think about other parts of the world. Where do we fit into this? Mm -hmm. right. Because may, in mainstream psychology, if you do not fit in historically, you will be pathologized, you will be lapped. But you are, you are being lapped and pathologized because somebody is using a theory which is out of touch with your culture. Right. So if you want to know why do I want to do, that's my answer. Of course. Sorry. Yes, of course. Oh my God. It's interesting to understand. And also, it really added a lot of value to my own understanding. And I also wanted to um, uh, uh, tell you that with the answers that you gave, it was so elaborate that it almost was symbolic of telling like everyone who's watching this that academia or any field of discipline is so congested with uh, dominant voices that it's so important for representation to counter those voices because small snippet to add that we understand this problem and belong and uh, this is what I was telling you earlier what we are trying to do through belong circle we address the vacuum of um, representation in various social domains so I'm very very happy to have been having this conversation and also engaging with your answer uh -huh. very very interesting and meaningful right so I'll ask you, um, so I have a few follow-up follow up questions related to what you just said in terms of your answer, but I think they'll keep coming up. But the second question that I wanted to ask was um, in relation to decolonizing psychology, because you mentioned Africa and India. So in India, particularly, we're having a lot of conversation and almost a social movement to decolonize psychology so that we create a possi possibility for social change. Now in India, we have a history of having laws that um, reflect a certain colonial mindset. So we've been trying to reflect on it, revise it, and also you know, talk about uh, decolonizing therapy practices in India. So I, uh, you know, taking off from what you uh, mentioned earlier, could you help us identify the problems that are associated with Eurocentric biases in the discipline of psychology? and also how that impacts racial and ethnic minorities living in the UK. I know you've explained this a fair bit, but I would really like to um, see how this could be elaborated further. That's fine. You know, that's an issue of focus at the moment in the, um, in the British Psychological Society. Um, in front of me here, I've got this book here. Right. That's a magazine published every month by the British Psychological oh. Society. And it's yes. the, this, this particular, um, it was saying, standing against racism. Yes. I want you to, I want to read a few words for you directly from this publication. Yes. You know, um, it says, um, where was I going to? Be? I thought I had marked it there. But it's just trying to say that, um, yeah, psychologists focus on implicit bias. Small discriminatory acts are all too often understood as unconscious, offering a convenient and welcomed distraction 
to party prejudice. Discrimination mm -hmm. is seen as implicit bias, regardless of whether evidence to show that such behavior is unconscious. The negative impact that psychological theories and practices have had on minority groups is in further exacerbated by the failure of the parties that oversee the discipline to recognize the issue. So at the moment, the PPS is saying, well, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. So psychology is still racist mm -hmm. in 2020. Let's do something about it, yeah. you know. And I, um, I recently joined the, the PPS committee mm -hmm. and I'm keen to make my contribution mm -hmm. into bringing this change. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm part of the um, culture that's mm -hmm. underrepresented in the PPS. Right. So when I am in the PPS committee, I can, you know, bring stuff up from um, my perspective rather than having somebody who was born in the West talking about my experience. They wouldn't explain it as I will. Does right. it make sense? So why, why, why do I think psychology needs to be, to be decolonized? I, I can talk about this for an hour, Sindana, but I can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, give, let, me give you, let me give you, yeah, let me give you some main important points, okay? Sure. So number one, um, the, the bulk of, uh, of, of mainstream psychology, it still reflects and uh, promotes interest of the privileged minority. The privileged minority are the weird. Remember, I said the white, the educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Mm -hmm. So the bulk of psychology mm -hmm. reflects the interest of this small group. Mm -hmm. at the expense of the majority of the world. So if, this, if that's the case, then somebody has to do something. Somebody has to say, hold on, how about we have a version of psychology that is inclusive? How about we have a version of psychology that is informed by different cultural understandings of the whole world? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's one of the points. And I think um, there is a lot of, um, of historical facts mm -hmm. that are silenced in psychology. Sure. Yet these facts, they, they influence the psychology we teach today. But if we silence the history, it's the facts today appear like they are scientific. Yet their origin was not scientific, was pseudoscience and it was political. So mm -hmm. again, yes. if we're to talk about those silence, you know, mm -hmm. historical facts, mm -hmm. we'll be able to say, okay, let's try and see. Mm -hmm. how, were, how were these conceptualizations developed and why mm -hmm. and by who? We lived in which part of the world, mm -hmm. in which period? Then once we get into that, we will see how those um, historical developments are fitting into um, our, when, when they are silenced, they indirectly fit into the vision of psychology we have today, but at the same time, they, they indirectly perpetuate the bias. Mm -hmm. That's my second point on why psychology okay. should be um, decolonized. But I will mm -hmm. give you two more. I think I, I think I noted two more points here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mainstream psychology tends to marginalize and pathologize the majority of the world's people who live their lives last outside the context that give authoritative discourses, their authority. What that point means is when you live outside the, um, the Western world, Mm -hmm. You are likely to um, to be misunderstood. I've got a I've got a chapter in my book 
about being misunderstood is a very interesting mm -hmm. topic. We want to read that one day. I like you to be misunderstood because the person who is trying to write something about you, mm -hmm. the person who is trying to write a theory about you, mm -hmm. sees the world from a small box mm -hmm. of the minority group mm -hmm. that is dominant. Mm -hmm. And when these theories are then generalized to everybody else, the answer is we get a disaster out of that. So ethnocentrism is, um, is something that is there, you know, um, in psychology mm -hmm. and is something that, you know, many critical psychologists are working hard to counter. You know, so critical psychologists have got a number of um, channels now where they are feeding so much of, you know, debates and discussions into, mm -hmm. into. And I think that's um, a very progressive movement within mm -hmm. uh, social psychology. And my last point on why so so psychology should be um, decolonized is that mainstream psychology illuminates the radicalized colonial standpoint of mm -hmm. authoritative forms of knowledge that practitioners and consumers typically regard as context independent truth. So this point is similar to, um, in a way, to the point I, ra I raised when I was talking about my interest in culture. When you, when you take Western concepts into, for example, India, you will discover that, um, you know, the, these ideas are not in touch Mm -hmm. or they are not fully in touch with the Indian context. Mm -hmm. so part of the decolonization is let's do, let's promote cultural psychology. Mm -hmm. Let's have researchers going into India mm -hmm. and get in touch with the Indian culture, Indian people, speak mm -hmm. to them, understand things from their perspective before you write anything about them. Does it make sense? You go to Africa, sit down with people, learn their culture, understand their way of living, their everyday realities, and then build a theory from that understanding mm -hmm. rather than take a Western theory and impose it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are a few reasons among many why we need to decolonize psychology. Very concisely put. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, um, another, I, I had a follow-up question, but again, that is more or less answered. Um, okay. I still feel, um, you know, you're free to add any other points or suggestions you'd like. Question was about um, the field of social psychology, but also academy in general. You know, um, in any country, in globally or within uh, certain context, um, um, within situational context of the country, academia is generally, um, in you know, it involves a rich incidence of prejudice and bias against marginalized identities. Um, would you like to elaborate a little bit, considering that you've been working and studying in the UK since quite some time, and also um, suggest some ways on, as to how this problem could be addressed? How could we make academia more inclusive? Um, towards um, people um, who are possibly first generation learners, people who come from marginalized groups from various countries, um, apart from what we are usually considered to be the mainstream. Okay, well, there are, um, I don't want to disregard theories of um, prejudice that are in there. I really respect them. They are really mm -hmm. helpful you know, in, mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. But um, I have my views and I have my, you know, my contribution. Mm -hmm. I really believe that cultural psychology mm -hmm. gives us tools, mm -hmm. you know, for combating um, mm -hmm. um, racial prejudice. Mm -hmm. Because once we 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 get people to have tolerance mm -hmm. for different ways of 
experiencing reality in different cultures, across different cultures in the world. Mm -hmm. That will help people to, um, you know, understand that there is no culture superior from the other. Mm -hmm. It's a social construction. You, you make it in your mind and you believe your own life. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is no culture that's superior to the other. If you go to China, people will eat with sticks. If you have seen that on TV, isn't it? Maybe you do that in India. You come to the UK, people eat with fork and knife. Mm -hmm. Then I cannot sit here and say, look, the Chinese are wrong because they are using sticks. Mm -hmm. You know, they are just doing things differently. That's all. I can construct that as wrong and inferior if mm -hmm. I want to. But the truth of the matter is, that's my view, that's my construction. Maybe it's based on my ignorance. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I have got, um, I think I can share a few, maybe two, two points that I think uh, might be very helpful for that. So, number one, um, we need to accept that all research is done from a philosophical standpoint. It's not objective as main uh, positivist psychology things. It's impacted by the agenda and the culture of the researcher, among other things. So all kinds of concepts, um, you know, think of all constructs in psychology, all concepts. These, um, these are intellectual outputs of scholars who draw from their beliefs, their cultural resources. So if we, if we understand that, that research is not really neutral, you know, but research is, um, is, it, it is projected from a particular standpoint. That will really help to take the prejudice down because we will, we will see and understand research differently. You know, I have got my views about life and the world. And I will be, I will be not sincere if I say my philosophical views are not reflected in what I write. But the good thing is, uh, as a qualitative researcher, I do explicitly say how my philosophical views impact um, whatever kind of research I will be, you know, I will be um, writing at that time. So there's a need for an inclusive forms, rather an inclusive focus of normalizing accounts of marginalized settings to challenge the weird patterns that inform conventional scientific wisdom as natural standards that do not require explanation. So uh, the last point is we need to understand that the Western version of understanding things is not natural. That's a big point right there. The Western version of understanding things is not natural, it's a social construction. These, these, these are intellectual outputs of scholars, you know. So if we treat this as natural, we will have a problem in dealing with prejudice. But we need to say, okay, so these views have been expressed. But what is the philosophical standpoint of the individual behind the views? I know that this point makes sense. Can explain a bit more if you want, but um, I think these are the points I wanted to put across in relation to this person. Right. Sure. Thank you so much for that. That absolutely makes sense. I think this interview is turning out to be really insightful for researchers who are uh, who are going to be delving into the field of social psychology because so many uh, new points for them to consider. So thank you so much again for that. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, my second question is, um, 
I will first talk about a little, like to talk a little bit about India, and then um, um, uh, help you maybe ask you to um, talk about um, the context within the UK. So um, at so we at Belong were constantly trying to talk about addressing mental health within the specificity of identities. We tried to say mental health is political, and so should mental health care be political. Um, and we we've, we've been trying to generate conversations and. Um, in the last um, seven, eight months, we've come to understand that a lot of mental health care providers in the country are not trained on social structures. So the field of psychology in India, the formal study of psychology in India is very exclusive of understanding social structures. So um, you've been, you've studied in the UK and you've also like had experience working in the country. So if you could help us understand a little bit about how is study of psychology or how is social psychology perceived in the UK and how is where is UK in terms of um, placing identities at the core of mental health do this political or are there more conversations to happen so it would be great if you could help us lead on that okay well I can answer that question to a certain extent because I am not really a mental health expert. Mm -hmm. However, sure. um, you know, um, my previous answer about uh, why I chose to do cultural psychology as part of mm -hmm. what I do is in a way to that. Um, right. I think in the UK, um, we, there is a need for um, more culturally informed mm -hmm. um, policies to mm -hmm. understanding what mental health is. I, had a, mm -hmm. I, I read the story mm -hmm. um, on the newspaper, mm -hmm. you know, sometime in 2018. Mm -hmm. There is this gentleman, he was not born in the UK. Mm -hmm. He was born um, in an African country in the Western part of the world, mm -hmm. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. He was driving a car mm -hmm. and the police stopped. They mm -hmm. wanted to see his license. Mm -hmm. And the police walked, when, when he stopped this car, the police came over to him and said, sir, um, we stopped you because we want to see your license. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman said, okay, you want to see my license? I've got my license here, I'll show it to you. But why are you not stopping all these white drivers? around mm -hmm. me. Why did you stop me specifically? Then some, you know, exchange of rantings began from that point. Mm -hmm. And the Nigerian guy raised his voice. Mm -hmm. You know, he was annoyed and he raised his voice until the police thought, oh, oh, I must be taking him to a mad man here. Why is he not calm? Why is he raising his voice like this? You know, and uh, later on, some pressure groups were saying, no, the police officer failed to understand the culture. And they were mm -hmm. saying, you know, in Nigeria, people can talk like that. But that's mm -hmm. in, usually in the UK, people are calm. You know, mm -hmm. people are, you know, they don't raise their voices. They are calm and they talk to you polite. The gentleman was not polite. Mm -hmm. He was lifting up his voice which I understand mm -hmm. from his culture, but how they talk. But um, mm -hmm. this gentleman was misunderstood because in his culture, he does the different. I think really will be more effective in supporting people with mental health issues if we understand, if we invest in, um, if, if we invest in seeking to understand the diversity of cultures that are right. reflected in the UK. In the UK, they yeah. said, you know, in the UK, there is a almost, you know, almost the, I might be wrong, but I think the whole world is represented in the UK. You have got all nationalities, all ethnicities, all people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think if, we, if the country is going to be, if our health services are going to be more, um, you know, tailored into the needs of the people and be right. able to help everyone, we cannot really take the approaches that were developed long ago when the UK was almost 
you know, white throughout. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people now who are, who, who are not white, who are not born in the UK, who mm -hmm. came from other countries. So mm -hmm. I think these kinds of people are likely to be, um, number one, misdiagnosed, yeah. to be thought of having mental health problems when they don't. Mm -hmm. And I think we are likely to miss them when they mm -hmm. need help because we are failing to understand their culture. So if we can have service, mental health services that are informed by culture, I think we will be in a better um, position to help people. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. uh, even in India, we've been trying to revive the concept of cultural psychiatry. And uh, yeah, this just affirms to stand. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay. So um, I know at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that uh, your interest and also um, your substantive work has been done around gender-based discrimination. So um, if you could tell us a little bit about that and also if there is any other research uh, undertakings you've um, done apart from social psychology that you'd want to talk about, some interesting research findings that you'd want to share with us. So please feel free to do that. Okay. So. Um... Myself and a colleague here at Martin University have been um, looking at domestic violence in um, the Malcolm diaspora country living in the UK. We really have got uh, okay. some interesting findings from that paper. It's still under publication. I think it will be out not long now. Maybe, you know, when it's read, I'll share it with you once it's in the process now. So one of the, um, you know, very interesting things that we found was that, um, is that culture, particularly the Zimbabwean culture, played a significant role in normalizing domestic violence against women. So men in Zimbabwe are socialized in a way that, um, you know, treating a woman is, um, is something that can happen and it can be treated as something that must stay, you know, at home. It's, it cannot, sometimes it cannot be reported as a, 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 a crime. It can be treated as a domestic issue. Culture, which is patriarchal in nature, we found that it promotes that and it directly feeds into that. But keep in mind, I'm talking about Zimbabweans who live in the UK. And one of the um, findings that we uh, came up with was that despite the changing demands and cultural influences, it is clear that Zimbabwean men are resistant to change, resorting to violence to maintain traditional gender domestic role. So even though the UK is a more, is a more liberal country, you know, that promotes and supports the rights of women. You know, men and women are equal. But um, the map and men that took part in our study, they were um, resistant to change. They are resisting that. Want a woman to go to work like them, come back warm, cook for children, clean the house, give them food, wash, they do their laundry, and, and they do nothing. Which in Zimbabwe is, uh, you know, a traditional practice, acceptable. But you, you really wouldn't think of somebody resisting or trying to maintain that in the UK. But unfortunately, we discover that these are some of things that, um, you know, are still happening. And also we um, also um, discovered that domestic violence is something that is tolerated and not publicized. And that non-disclosure is learned practice. So when domestic happens within the home, Sometimes, interestingly, some of the, um, you know, in our literature review, we notice that um, some of the women in Zimbabwe, they think that it's okay 
for their husband to beat them if they do um, certain things. So they were socialized in a way to as to tolerate certain forms of domestic violence. And um, in the UK, domestic violence is a very serious thing. But Zimbabwean women who live in the UK can be beaten by their husbands or their boyfriends or partners and still not report the violence because they tolerate it. Sometimes they think of being uh, beaten, for example, as justified. You know, in some of the accounts that we, 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 we explored, they thought of that as something that is justified. And I think another thing that we um, found in, in, the, in, the, in the paper was that when men are the ones on the receiving end of domestic violence, they also will not, they also will not report it. They think of reporting a woman as something that is very embarrassing culturally. So they have to be men, they have to be strong, they have to deal with it. They are not going to report that. That's one of the findings. And finally, um, the justification of female support nation promotes and leg legitimizes the domestic violence. And also this is connected to the construction of sexual identity. So the culture says the woman should be um, in support nation for men. And that hierarchical structure, in a way, imposes the superiority of men over women. And that legitimizes domestic violence. So that's the findings of. Um, of our recent paper on um, gender-based violence. Thank you so much for sharing that, Professor. I think it's uh, a similar story with men all over the world. So no surprises <laughs> there, but very, very good to know that. Uh, yeah, so I wish we could continue this conversation. I, I would love to participate, but then we unfortunately understanding we have a little bit of time restrictions i've come to the last question and then maybe we can move on to um uh, understanding a little bit from you i mean uh, you know asking if you would have anything to conclude or if you would have anything else to add um so uh, my last question is uh, you've done a fair a fair amount of work on social psychology and you're also looking to expand more and gender-based discrimination is again one such area where you're exploring your work in. But, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about more streams that you've been able to identify um, working on identities and psychology in the UK? What is it? What else is there to research on? What is it that you want to work in the future? So something like that. Well, OK, um, you know, in terms of the um, of this, um, the current project that we are doing with my colleague. We, we interviewed about editing. So I've got a lot of other to work on. We are looking to, we're looking forward to publishing a few more papers out of that. Right. And yeah, uh, right. in terms of what have I found, I've shared that with you, you know, I'm going to be looking into that for a couple of a while. Um, right. but, um, another interesting thing which I want to, which comes back here, which I mentioned earlier, when I look at mm -hmm. identities, is that sometimes um, political agendas mm -hmm. and ideologies mm -hmm. are put ahead of science. Especially, I, I can prove this with my research on identical things. Mm -hmm. I think I did highlight why I'm saying this, how, mm -hmm. you know, some people were trying to um you know push their their controversial ideas and push their political agendas and you know invent or perpetuate scientific racism through you know the identities of you know the, the twins and you know these kinds of things but mm -hmm. uh in terms of um what to do in future really i am open to a lot of things i always keep my mind open to anything interesting but I think for the rest of this year, 
and maybe the early part of the first six months of next year, I'm going to be writing a bit more about diaspora culture and send up okay. as well. Right, right. That sounds great and exciting. I think it will be helpful to Fester if you could share a few papers. We could link the, the papers to this video. So if people would like to access some of the papers that you've written, uh, we can do so. We can link these papers on the dis description box if you'd like that. Okay, that's fine. I'll send them over to you after you. Okay, great. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? A concluding remark perhaps, which will um, which you'd like to share? Well, not really, uh, I mean, just to thank you so much, you know, and the, um, the Belong team, you know, for um, reaching out. I am excited to be part of you know, this group. As I say to you, you are um, my first link in India, and I look forward to working with you. I'm looking okay. forward to, you know, developing our professional relationship, and we can do okay. things together which are of mutual interest. Perfect, thank you.